23rd chapter of Bereshit's uh, Genesis, it's, we're, we're in this parsha, very familiar, it's the death of Sarah. And it's actually titled, Sarah Lives, but it talks about her death. Um, the, the whole story, as I read through it uh, over and over again, something really stood out to me that I felt was a very important lesson for this day, for this time period. And so I'd like to call the shiur the power of ownership. The power of ownership. Very, very important subject matter. It says that Sarah's lifetime was 100 years, 20 years, and 7 years. In years of Sarah's life, Sarah died in Kerit Arba, which is in Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to utilize Sarah and bewail her. Abraham rose up from the presence of his dead and spoke to the children of Heath, saying, I'm an alien or a ger and, you, uh, and a resident among you. Grant me an estate for a burial site with you that I might bury my dead for, from uh, before me. Now, if we go through and we continue to read, we realize it's a piece of land that is um, in, uh, in the field of Ephron, which is the cave of Mechpelah. This cave was, uh, was not just a cave, any cave. It was a cave capable of burying all of the descendants of Abraham. And also, they say, Adam and Eve are buried in the same cave. This piece of land was a very important piece of land. When Abraham left Ur of Chaldees, did he know he was going to go to this place? No. Had no idea. It was a journey. And in this journey, it said that God did these things for him and favored him because he followed all of his commandments. He continued to walk with God as we've learned over these last few weeks. He was absolutely trust worthy by Hashem and trusted Hashem, even so much as to take his own son and, and put him on an altar to sacrifice him. He was willing to do all those things. But yet he had not gained ownership or possession. There is a big difference between owning something and renting it, or owning and borrowing. Now we all know as adults that if you want to teach your child a lesson, you let them take part ownership in purchasing something that you feel like that is very valuable because they, you would hope that they would learn to appreciate it more. Owning a car. Some might, a friend of mine and I were talking about our parents. My parents were older when they had me. So uh, I don't know how, how old your parents were, but mine, I think they were in their 40s when I was born. right? So they were like Depression era, World War II, and most of my friends, their parents were from the Korean era, right? Does it make sense? A little bit different era, or Vietnam. And my parents felt like, if you want it, you buy it. Was any of your parents like that? My parents were like, if you want it, you buy it, because you'll appreciate it. And if you didn't have the money, they would be more than glad to give you a loan. But you were going to pay them back, right? I mean, that's all it was. And you were going to pay back some way. If it, you didn't have money, because when you're nine, you don't have money for walkie-talkies. You paid back with something. Like, you're going to learn all of your multiplication tables, and you're going to learn whatever. Memorize this. I can remember memor having to memorize um, a, one of the Psalms. Oh, and then my mom picked the biggest Psalm there was, right? <laughs> had to memorize that and be in the car every time. Let me say a little bit more, memorize this song. But it caused me to appreciate the things that I have. And as I've grown up and grown older, I realized that there is a power of ownership. And Avraham here is going to bury his wife. In this text, actually, it says that he, he bewailed her, he wept for her, but he didn't do a whole lot of mourning. It's interesting because they, they, the way they get that is the actual vav in the text shows that it was little. It's small. It's written in the, in the Torah scroll. If we were to pull it out, you could actually see it in the text. He mourned her a little. Why did he mourn her a little? Because he knew she was a righteous woman, lived a long, very beautiful life, and it was, it was her time. But with the death of his wife starts a new era. 
That means that he's getting ready to get a daughter-in-law. That means that his children are getting ready to take the place of the patriarchy. And Abraham knew this is where I need to have some ownership. It's time for us all to grow up and become a family that is responsible to do what God has called us to do. I want to buy this land. So what did Ephron do when he said he wanted to buy the land? It's like, ah, what's, what's, what's a land deal amongst friends, right? No charge. Someone said, always be leery of uh, Middle Eastern saying, oh, my friend, I have a friend, my friend, I have a deal for you, right? You hear my friend, you've got a problem. Tom, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> you go to the market in Jerusalem, and you see some Arab guy standing there, and he goes, my friend, my friend, I have a deal for you. You know, okay, I'm getting ready to take it. So this is what Abraham's up against. But you see, that field and that place had to be purchased. He tells him, I'm a stranger. I don't want to be a stranger anymore. I want to have ownership. I want to purchase this. The guy says, ah, what's land? You take it, my friend. My friend, take it. And he offers, which was a great amount of money, I mean, they've tried to figure out what the equivalent of the sages, say, uh, 2,000 years ago, were trying to figure out how much was this amount. But we're talking about probably close to a million dollars. Think about it. A million dollars is a lot of money to pay for a couple of caves and some acreage. Now you understand why that Israelis are willing to fight and die for this land? This is why, because it belongs to them. He's not the only one that purchased land. You remember David Amalek when he was going to offer sacrifices? It's found in 2 Samuel, the 24th chapter, around verse uh, uh, 23 through 25. He goes and he sees the, the, he's there where the Temple Mount is going to be, and he's going to offer up a sacrifice because the people were dying of a horrible disease. The guy says, I will be more than glad to give you the land and give you all the cattle you want. He was a gear, probably, more than likely a non-Jew, who's going to say, whatever you want, you can have it. David says this. I want to read this out so I can get it uh, straight. He says, your majesty, our owner, gives all this to the king. Our owner also said to him, may the Lord your God accept you. But the king replied to our owner, no, I insist on paying for it. I will not sacrifice to my Lord God burnt offerings that does not cost me, or that cost me nothing. So David brought the, bought the threshing floor and the oxen and paid 50 shekels of silver for them. David built an altar to the Lord, and there the sacrifice, uh, sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then the Lord answered his prayer on behalf of the land, and the plague on Israel was stopped. Everyone that's in this room and those who are watching who have made this arduous journey out of Christianity into the light of Torah have developed ownership. Let me explain to you why and how that ownership has developed. And I think that you'll recognize what I'm talking about. At some point in your journey, you realized that this isn't about what your family has done. This isn't about what your friends have done and what your maybe associations in, in your church or your, or your community group. It's about my responsibility to my God. It's about do I have ownership in my relationship with God? And if I do, I have to be responsible for it. I just hung up from... A uh, young man who said that he came to the place that he knew that he had to make a decision about believing that there is one God and there is no other God but the God of Abraham. And he says, I knew that time had come when I began to fear God more than I ever feared him before. I realized, oh my goodness, if he's the only one true God, why am I still believing that there is another God, that there is somebody else who's an intermediary. And he talked about having his own ownership and saying, I've, I've got to make a stand. If nobody else in the world does it, I've got to make a stand. And he said he was so encouraged when he watched our videos, he realized, oh my goodness, there are other people like this. So he has felt encouraged by knowing there are other people that have taken ownership. Accountability breeds responsibility. Accountability breeds responsibility. 
You see, my challenge today is to be like an Abraham who says, despite what all the rest of the world's doing and what they continue to do, I have one mission, and that is to walk with God and to serve Hashem. That I'm going to do, and I will continue to walk this journey until God tells me to stop, and when He tells me to stop, I'm laying down stakes, putting down stakes, and I'm going to buy the land. I'm going to have full ownership. I remember when I um, had children for the first time, and you remember that sort of rush that comes over you? At some point, after you get children, this, this thing sort of comes over you going, I need to grow up and be a, an adult now, all right? It's like, I can't be a kid anymore. I've got to be an adult. I've got to be the adult now. All of us need to have ownership in our relationship with God. We have to take ownership in the process. Let me explain what that means. You see, I can't wait on somebody else to help me with the process. Though we need a rabbi, we cannot put our trust in the rabbi for the process. We have to take responsibility for ourselves to do what we are supposed to do. We do what is right because this is the way God says it. Ownership first in my relationship with Hashem. Let's talk about this for a moment. What does that mean, ownership in my relationship with Hashem? Do I do things only because I'm told that they're wrong or right? Or do I do them because I love Hashem with my whole heart? Now some says, I have, as a matter of fact, I heard Rabbi Mizraki say just the other day, that a person who does tshuva for the sake of love, uh, loving Hashem is at the highest level. Because a person who does tshuva out of pure fear is really not the highest level. Are you, do you do tshuva and repent because are you scared of going to hell or do you do in tshuva because you truly do love Hashem and you don't want to disappoint Him? See, that is the highest level. And my friend, I'm telling you right now, my friend, I sound like the, the, the Arab in the market. I'm not trying to sell you something. My friend, if I say it like that, I have. But I'm going to tell you, listen, um, Every person that I know of that is in that has come out of Christianity into the B'nai Noach movement are people at the highest spiritual level. They truly do love God with their whole heart. And that is the reason why they're here. And so the idea of making tshuva, not because they're scared of going to hell, because they've had the hell scared out of them when in the church, right? That's already been scared out of them. Now they do it because they love their God. They love the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they realize that there is a responsibility, ownership. How do I take ownership in my relationship with God? I take ownership in my relationship with God when I recognize that there is only one God and that His Torah is true. I take ownership when I begin to live my life as if God was actually real. Someone said the other day in a lecture, and I, I found it quite interesting, he said, Maybe if you knew that God really exists, you would be taking better notes in the class. And I was like, yeah, I've got to find a piece of paper, right? But it's true. I mean, a lot of times we, ju we just say He's real, but does it really change us at the core? Does that make sense? Does it cause you to really be a different human being because we know God is real? And I think sometimes we take it uh, for granted our relationship with God, and I think it's just human nature, to be honest with you, because I love my parents, but I'm going to tell you right now, I took for granted my relationship with my mother and father. They are two people that I miss dearly. To this day, am I right? You never quit aching for the hug of your mother and the embrace of your father. You never, you never lose that. I will, I'll run across a photograph. As a matter of fact, my sister is planning a, a, a social with all of my brothers and sisters and nephews and uh, nieces. And she posted a picture of my mom and dad. And I was like, oh, man, I miss them so much. And it's not a sadness now as much as I miss them. And then I remember my wife, when she had it open, I said, uh, I want to see them soon. We're going to see them. We're going to be with those people one day. That is because I'm assured of my relationship and my ownership and my relationship with God. Yes, I do believe we take for granted our relationship with God. But folks, truly be willing to pay the price to have that relationship. What does it mean to pay the price? 
It means that I'm willing to do whatever it takes to maintain my relationship with the Creator. Next, ownership in Torah learning. We all understand that Torah learning is, is uh, the, the level in which you, your midot, what's the word, uh, your, um, help me, um, your intent on studying Torah. The level of midot or intent that you put into the study of Torah is what you're going to get out of it. You remember when Hashem says to his people, if you treat me casually, I will treat you casually. If we approach Torah casually, like, yeah, not a big deal. I'll try to get, you know, I'll, I'll try to study something the next couple of weeks. Do you not realize that that's how Hashem will begin to see you? As, oh, you're in this relationship as a casual relationship. You really don't have ownership. And uh, right before class, uh, Charlie mentioned that she had another lecture she wanted me to see. She goes, I don't bother you, busy and all that stuff. You got plenty of other stuff to study. I said, no, you don't understand. If you have the study schedule that I have, you always need material. You always need material. You never run out of Torah material. Just put it in the, in the rack and play it sooner or later. But having Torah, a real ownership in Torah learning means that what I learn is also what I do. Torah learning requires me to do something. When we learned about Abraham last week when he circumcised himself and there in the heat of the day in his suffering, uh, immediately went into his prime directive to be the greatest man of chesed, loving kindness, to run out to the angels that he thought were just three scrubby men walking through the desert. Any other person would have said, I'm in pain, I need to take another, you know, Tylenol, let them pass on by, we'll deal with them later on. No, not him. He even puts Hashem on hold. Do you realize that? He put the creator of the universe on hold and said, Hop, stop, just a second, I'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. And he runs off to go greet these three men. How many times have we missed opportunity to do mitzvah because we were too busy trying to be holier than thou? It's very easy to do, but if we take ownership in our Torah learning, then we will realize that there is one thing that demonstrates my love for the Torah is that my life reflects the character and the essence, the beauty of Torah. Every opportunity running to make a mitzvah. And this was another thing that just struck me in the lesson last week as, as uh, Sebastian was reading the lesson when he talked about how, how uh, Abraham ran. He, he didn't stroll, he didn't strut, he ran to do a mitzvah. Can you imagine how it pleases the heart of the Creator when he sees his people running to do a mitzvah? An opportunity to really go over the top and, and do a big mitzvah. Next, ownership in our relationships. What do we mean by that? Invest in your relationships with people within the Torah community. It's very important. The ladies are better at it than us guys, to be honest with you. The ladies do a really good job with it. I'm not sure what it is about the guys. We're just busy and working. And I, yeah, I think so. I think so. You guys are. That's just. You guys are better at that than than we are. It doesn't mean that we don't care. It's just you guys are better at that. But still, investing in our relationships are very important. Our relationship with community. Our support of a community. Our support with people within the community. You guys are very conscientious about helping people that are in difficult times in our community and sending special prayers for them. You communicate on a, better, on, on a daily basis. So ownership and re relationships. And next is ownership in your family lifestyle. Ownership in your family. Taking ownership and responsibility for your relationship with your spouse, with your children, those people that have children that are already gone out of the house. Uh, it's really important. Why? Because family is the very nucleus that we are able to demonstrate our, our holiness and our love for God. Avraham negotiates this field. It says, now Ephraim, in verse 10, it says, now Ephraim was set, setting in the midst of the children of Heath, and Ephraim, the Hittite, responded to Abraham in the hearing of the children of Heath, for all who came to the gate 
of his city, saying, No, my Lord, t- uh, heed me. I have given you the field as you have as for the cave that is in it. I give it to you. In view of the children of my people, have I given it to you. So why was he willing to give this to Abraham? The people liked him, right? He was a great guy. He's a super good guy. Already, obviously, done plenty of mitzvahs to impress people. But Abraham says, So Abraham bowed down before the members of the council, and he spoke to Ephraim in the hearing of the members of the council, saying, Rather, if only you would heed me. So he opens up the conversation to Abraham. Just listen to me. Here, I've already given it to you. And he goes, No, no, no. You hear me. Just listen to me. Heed me. And he says, I give the price of the field, accept it from me, that I might bury my dead there. And Ephraim replied to Abraham, saying to him, My Lord, heed me, land worth 400 silver shekels between you and me. What is it? Bury your dead. Abraham heeded Ephraim, uh, heeded Ephraim and Abraham weighed out to Ephraim the price which he had mentioned in the hearing of the children of Heath, 400 silver shekels in negotiated cur- negotiable currency, which was the currency of the age. And Ephraim's field, which was Mechala, facing uh, Mamre, the field and the cave within it, and all the trees in the field within all the surrounding boundaries, was confirmed. Abraham bought this piece of land. His, all of his family ends up going into Egypt. All of his family. Everybody over the age of 40 after leaving Egypt died because they were not willing to take ownership of the land. They stood at the edge of the land and heard the spies as they began to speak against the land. They began to speak Lashonara against the land. The people heard it and they trembled and they cried. They said, our children will become slaves in the land. Think about what they were saying. This was no longer their land. This land belonged to the Canaanites in their mind. They had lost ownership. They had lost ownership of the very land that their forefathers had taken and purchased. It is in this land these people looked across, and even though it had land was flowed with milk and honey, and it had dates that were huge and fruit that was humongous, it wasn't their land anymore. They weren't invested in the land. You see, you and I know people just like this today that you will try to share with them the beauty of Torah. You've taken the trip and or you've taken the tour around, and you share with them, and they have no investment in the Torah. None. It means nothing to them. It absolutely means nothing. If anything, they will almost repeat to you the same thing that the children of Israel repeated to Caleb and and Joshua. That land will consume us. Oh my goodness, if I believe all that, I don't it'll overwhelm me. Can't study that much. See, they didn't have an investment in the land. The people that were 40 and below followed through the desert for all those years. They watch their family members die one by one. And slowly but surely they realize that if somehow they they don't develop an ownership of their relationship with Hashem, their relationship with Torah, their relationship with each other, they will never be able to take the land. And then the time right before, and we just passed this in in, in the last end of the cycle, where they're standing there and Moshe is talking to them, and he already gave Joshua his blessing. He's, Joshua's going to lead them into the land. And he tells them, this is what God will do. As long as you follow his commandments and you will take heed to them, you will possess the land. Now what is following his commandments and taking heed to him? It's taking ownership in your relationship, taking ownership in your Torah learning and how you conduct yourself and your relationship and how you relate, relate to each other. He says, but when you get to the land and you are sated and satisfied, and you then will begin to do things according to your own heart, 
what you think is right, meaning you have walked out of your ownership or relationship with Hashem, you have left your relationship in Torah learning, and you have forgotten about your relationship responsibilities to those people in the community. He says, when this happens, the land will kick you out. That's heavy. You see, a one-time purchase does not constitute a permanent residence. You have to constantly keep the thing up. If anybody owns their own house, you realize how much it costs to keep your own house up. Sometimes I wonder if it's easier to rent. You just call somebody and they come fix the, the, the house up, but it costs to own. The problem is, is people have a relation. That's their relationship with God. Oh, I was born a Jew. I'm okay. Or I've been in this for a long time. I'm okay. God's okay. Everything's all right. But this is a permanent e expression of our relationship with God. Israel is told that when you get to the land, and if you do these things and you are booted out, which it happens, they're told by the great prophet that one day God will restore them to their land. Now we already see that Israel was reestablished it's become a nation, a powerful nation in the Mideast. And today, young men and women join the IDF and have lost their life. Families have planted their sons and daughters in graves. And they do have a true ownership in the land of Israel. You and I are today developing our ownership and our relationship with God to His land and to His Torah. And it is from this text that we realize that anything worth the treasure is worth the spending. It's worth the money that it takes to buy this. You know, they say it's a great mitzvah to buy, for example, a Torah book that costs you a lot. For the men to buy it, I mean, uh, phylacteries to wrap, to if you can afford it, you try to buy the most expensive phylactery that you can buy. Why? Because you can't afford to be cheap in your relationship with the Creator. I can't imagine. I love my wife, and I realize that she would probably knock me in the head if I bought her a $30,000 wedding ring. But the point is, is I was able to buy her what I could out of the money that I had. And she was so happy and pleased because I did the best I could. What Hashem was looking for is the best that you can do. You might not be able to, uh, be able to order the whole Talmud series, might not be able to pay for it, but you can go buy one book from the Talmud, or you can buy yourself a nice chumash, spend the money on it, keep it in a very special place, well lit at night when you go to bed. You can make that book uh, a very special thing by investing in your relationship with God. I pray that after you leave tonight, that you will leave with a new appreciation to take ownership in your relationship with God. Ownership and everyone should know that relationship that you have with the Creator. We all brag about stuff that we just buy, right? We always like to brag. Oh, I just bought this, I bought that. If you like my wife, she brags about buying the cheapest thing that she can buy, right? She Whatever, how much money she saves. She is like, I, I, she'll, it's funny because she'll come and she goes, you'll never guess how much I, I saved on this. And I said, how much you pay for it? She goes, it's only $3 for this nice sweater. She has saved a lot of money. But you see, when you have ownership in your relationship with God, you really don't have a problem talking about it, do you? You don't have a problem letting people know what that relationship means to you. So I encourage you, as you go out this week, you're going to be spending time with family members and friends. Don't be afraid to express how much you truly love His Torah and how much you truly love Him. That concludes the shiur. If anybody has any questions, comments, now would be the time.